A very good evening and welcome to We're Not Really Here. We are back at the Etihad. And tonight's opponents are West Brom with an 8pm kickoff, and we're going to be getting into all of that beforehand. Manchester City have won their last 13 Premier League games against West Brom, scoring 37 goals and conceding just nine. So it does bode well. And this is actually the Citizens' longest winning run against a specific opponent in their top flight history. West Brom have never won a Premier League game at the Etihad in 11 attempts, drawn two and lost nine. And with their last away league win at Manchester City coming in February 2003 at Main Road. Very good evening and welcome along. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Kel Spellman and this is We're Not Really Here. Joining me this week, we have got Natalie Pavacek, Mr. Paul Dickoff, and making his We're Not Really Here debut, Andy Morrison. Welcome along, sir. So great to have you on. I mean, must have been a while since you were last at the Etihad. It'll be um, it was March last year, just before the lockdown. I okay. think uh, it was the last game, so it's been a long time. It's good to be back. It's so great to have you, and I know lots of City fans are going to be really buzzing that you're on. Paul, great to be with you. How's everything been with you? Yeah, all good. Looking forward to the game. It's actually the first, I mean, I've done quite a few of these now, but it's the first time we're actually at the stadium and watching the game um, live. You know, we've watched it in the screens, we've watched it over at the CFA. So looking forward to actually seeing the teams out there tonight. It's always that it's that nice little bonus that we get, isn't it? And we try and bring you as close to the action uh, as possible. Um, Andy, though, I mean, first of all, I, I was going to say, but you've got quite the record when it comes to making debuts um, from your grid. Remind us what that brilliant start is. Well, I made my uh, debut for Plymouth um, when I was 17. I scored. Um, I scored against. Uh, I scored for Huddersfield, Blackpool, and obviously City here in a 2-1 win. So uh, I've had a good start at clubs. It's a very good start. So we're thinking maybe for the predictions later on in the show, you could be odds on to actually uh, get the prediction right. If we're going I'm not very good record. at predictions. <laughs> <laughs> not very good. Uh, Paul, but you've, you've not been too shabby as well on the predictions recently. Yeah, been all right. Got, um, the 3-0 right last week. Tried to be a bit too clever and name the goal scorers, but didn't quite get that. Right. So <laughs> I need to get back in my box a little bit, I think. No, no, no. Don't do because we've, we're, we're going to be getting a leaderboard out soon, I think. I think Sean Wright Phillips and Sean Goat have had enough. So I think goal scorers is going to be uh, for bonus points as well. Um, and Natalie, so great to have you back on. We've missed you these last couple of weeks. Yes, like Paul, I'm so excited. This is the first time I've been in the ground to watch a, watch a game um, this season. So really hoping that we're going to see a lot of goals um, tonight. And Andy, how many goals did you score for City? Because I don't remember you scoring a huge amount. So the fact that you scored one on your debut is <laughs> insane. I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not too sure. I think it, it's five or six, um, which is not bad in 40 opposite uh, uh, games. Best one's got to be the older one, isn't it? It was with a, without a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, 40 yards. <laughs> It goes up a couple each year, but no, it was a, it was a, it was a great goal. Was that one of them? Did he pull that out in training on more often than not? Or what? You know what? He did. Did he? He did, yeah. Um, I don't want to get him too big-headed now, but um, he, was, he was a lot better player than what he got the credit for. I think people looked at the size of him and um, how hard he tackled and how strong he was and getting involved in little scuffles here and there, but he was a fantastic footballer as well, and I think that took the other side of it away from it. I'm reliably told it was five goals, Andy, that you scored for City. Yep, yep. <laughs> Close enough. I mean, there's going to be so many fond memories. I think we have actually got some clips, but of course you leading the team out in that all-important game in, in 99. Looking back on your time at City, Andy, what sort of memories and feelings does it evoke? Just fond, you know, um, happy times. Um, we had great success, back-to-back um, -back promotions. Um, it doesn't get any better than that, you know, so uh, just great times. Yeah, brilliant. Look how yeah. young you are there. I know. Are you Tell saying you I'm old, Nat? Are you saying <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I guess, I mean, I, I mean, by the way, Andy, I mean, I dread to think, Paul, even in training, did you ever not just think I don't really fancy coming up against Andy today in training? <laughs> yeah, there was a few scuffles we had before Andy came in and after, but I, I do remember, I don't know if Andy remembers this, we were training um, and Willie Donicky gave a penalty um, against you, against me. Definite foul. <laughs> um, I have dived a little bit and Andy lost his head and literally... He picked me up with one hand. <laughs> I was on the floor on all fours. Do you remember this? I was back, backed into you and I fell over and Molly gave the penalty and you'd lost your head. And then just literally picked me up and threw me like a little doll. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, was, that was just in training. Yeah, that was in training. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and for, we actually uh, we couldn't find that footage, Paul, funnily enough. So we'll, uh, we'll take a word for it. Um, but no, Andy, it's great to have you on. And um, really going to be great to get your insight on the game and the team in a minute. But before that, um, Natalie, shall we get the all-important team for our game against West Brom this evening? 
Yes, let's get that team news. Very exciting. OK, so your starting 11 for tonight's game against West Brom is Edison in goal, of course, and he continues playing every single Premier League game this season. That's 12 now for Edison. And then our defence is Benjamin Mendy, Ruben Diaz, Nathan Ake and João Cancelo. And then in midfield, we have Rodri, who also starts every Premier League this season so far. That's 12 for Rodri. Alongside him is Ilkay Gundogan. Kevin De Bruyne and then we have Phil Foden starting and making his 50th Premier League start for City and alongside him is Raheem Sterling and Gabriel Jesus. Um, other news for the bench though we do have Sergio Aguero on the bench tonight he is back and he is joined by Zach Stefan, Kyle Walker, Amrit Laporte, Bernardo Silva, Fran Torres and Riyad Mahrez. Beautiful stuff. Thank you, Natalie. Um, now, a few changes there from that 0 0 draw against Manchester United. Um, we see Ake come into the lineup. Um, Mendy's back at left back, which I assume can cello at right back. How have you, what have you made of Manchester City's performances so far, and also particularly our defensive side of the game, Andy? I think it's been evolving this season, um, whether it's a transitional period or not. You know, we've got a lot of new players in. Um, again, is it Ake and Diaz his first time playing together tonight? Um, yeah, so. Is in the 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 system, the the roles and responsibilities. Um, they don't change. It's the same every week. Um, you know they'll know the patterns of play. They'll know what's expected of them. So, you know we won't see anything different. But you know different personnel, as in communication, uh, understanding. I'm sure the manager uh, believes in them. So, but for me, it's a it's a brave to make those changes. You know from the weekend. I think as well, I mean, Paul, you, you, Ake's coming there at left centre-back. I mean, probably more comfortable there than playing at left-back. Um, but, of course, Laporte again. Is it, do you think there's anything there for us to think about, or is it just great to see Ake getting in the team? I think it's great to see Ake getting the team. I think if you look at the, the centre-half partnership since the start of the season, it has changed. You know, it's been uh, Laporte-Diaz, it's been Diaz-Stones. Diaz seems to be the only one that, that seems to play, and that now Ake's in there as well. And look, Ake's a, uh, he's a top player. You know, he's got loads of Premier League experience. Um... I do agree with you. I think he's more comfortable at centre half. Um, but the, the big thing, me and Andy were talking off camera before it. You know, the, it's stopping the centre halves getting exposed. And I think having Rodri and um, Gundogan sitting in front of them defensively helps out a lot. And since we've been doing that, I think it's six clean sheets in a row. It is indeed, yeah. Know, which is a club record. So there's obviously proof in the pudding there that, that the team is changing a little bit. But we've still got that attacking threat going forward. With I mean, just look at the bench tonight. Seeing Aguero back again is fantastic. Oh, so good. I know. Name that we've missed indeed. Absolutely, yes, that's six clean sheets in a row, nine hours and 25 minutes. Nobody has scored against us now. Love Ins that, Matt. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Insane stat there. And a man that is stepping into that back line tonight, and we're hoping that we make it seven clean sheets, is Nathan Ake. And this is what he's had to say before the game. Nathan, there was a sense of frustration, I think, on Saturday. What elements of the performance need to be better tonight? Yeah, of course. I think it's obvious that we want to score goals. Uh, we want to win games. So, uh, yeah, that's the only thing uh, we're going to have to improve tonight. And, uh, yeah, I'm sure we're going to do our best for it. What's the manager emphasised to the team then in terms of being more, more clinical? Yeah, trying to go for it more, I think, sometimes. Um, I think today we have to start from the off straight away. Um, yeah, trying to, trying to search for goals, but also make sure we are solid in behind. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be the message for today. And what about West Brom? They're, they're struggling for points. I don't think they feel they're struggling for performances. And they, they pushed Chelsea, drew with Chelsea, just only lost to Tottenham. What, what sort of challenge are they? Yeah, we know how tough it's going to be. Uh, you know, every Premier, a Premier League game is going to be tough. Uh, they're going to come here and they want to take points off us. So we know we have to be strong. We know we have to be um, focused. And uh, that's what we're going to do. And a win takes you within three points of the leaders? Yeah, no, everything is close. Everything is close. But we just have to look at it game by game, uh, go for it, and then see what happens after the game. Good luck. Cheers. Thank you. I was Nathan Ake there giving his thoughts ahead of our game against West Brom and picking up on that final question, Andy, there's been a lot of talk around City, I mean, as there always is every season. At the start, we're kind of saying, has Pep lost his magic? Then suddenly we're not scoring enough goals and then we've solidified and people are still thinking, are we a bit off it? But you've heard there, we win tonight, we're three games off the top spot. Do you think it's maybe been exaggerated a bit how it's been made out by the press and there's not too much to worry about, do you think? I think with um, the, the form of the last two seasons, with the runs and the performances of Liverpool and, and City, this year is different. Um, teams are drop, they're dropping points, they're drawing games. There's not that outstanding, um, the two-horse race two seasons ago, last year Liverpool were incredible. Mm -hmm. This year teams are dropping points and it's a lot closer. 
I think, five points in the top eight or nine teams at the minute. So it's something that we've not seen for a long time. Um, and it's it's refreshing because it means that every game more teams are, are putting pressure on and asking more questions and you're not having to worry. Well, obviously you've got to win every game, but you're not, you know, looking over your shoulder every time at just one team because you know that teams are now Chelsea, Tottenham, Leicester are taking points off each other. Yeah. So it makes it a little bit more of a level playing field. Which is more exciting as well for, for us as fans. Another team um, in that t team lineup, Paul, is Mr. Phil Foden. 50th league appearance. Another player that gets talked to, I think, a lot about by, by other people in the press. Um, great to see him getting a start. Yeah, it is. And he's, he's been fantastic. And, you know, I think touching on Andy's point there, I think a lot of teams, not just City, they, they are rotating their squads and rotating their teams from week to week. Um, and we're just lucky we've got the talent to do that and I know a lot of people would like Phil to play more especially in Premier League um, he started Champions League game last week and was outstanding again mm -hmm. and every time he comes in he has an impact whether that's um, creating goals or scoring goals you know he came on his sub the other day there and put in his first touch a wonderful cross so he's always going to create things but it's his energy off the ball as well you know he's um, when Phil plays nine times out of ten when when Manchester City play the high press, he's the one that goes and sets it off for them. It is that energy as well. You can see it's for for everyone to see. And Andy, I know as well that I mean you played with a lot of brilliant young players in your time, but also worked quite closely with young players as well. I'd just be interested to know what is your assessment of of Phil Foden and his his rise at City over the last couple of years. I think it's remarkable, uh, considering you know the, what we've won and the, the success the club have had to actually be able to bed somebody in um, and stay in there. You know because. Fans will always want to see younger players come through, but when you've got the squad that City have and the expectations, um, you know, failure is not acceptable. You've got to be winning trophies and to actually bring somebody in and then for them to stay in with the group and the squad that City have, he has to be talented. He has to be extremely gifted to be able to stay in that, uh, that group and he, and he has now for a long period, so it's remarkable. You both work in coaching and management. Is that a difficult job, do you think, that Pep Guardiola does have on his hands? And not just Pep, because we know Cheeky and, and Soriano are all involved with the youth development. And, of course, Gareth Taylor, I know he's head of the women's, but was head of the academy. Is it a harder job than, I think, we as fans give it credit for to, to bring in youth into a team of the stature of Manchester City, as Andy said? I think it is, especially when you, you know you look at the squad. And Phil, it's not, it's not saying his 50th appearances, but he's he's been prominent in the first team squad for three years now. Agreed. Um, and he's been in there around it. And I think the club have managed him unbelievably well. You know, especially a couple of seasons ago, 18 months ago, there was a huge clamour from everybody about him going out and loan. Um, and the way they've managed him as a player and his development has been great. And he's so much better off. He's training every day. Well or has been David Silva, Kevin yeah. De Bruyne, Sergio Aguero, Vincent Company when he first came in. He's going to benefit so much more from that than, than he would have been going out and playing games and still getting game time in his year. Um, and as well as the club getting credit, I think Phil's got to take a lot of credit as well because he's he's stuck by it. How many times do we see, especially younger kids, who are the next best thing and so-called superstars, their agents come out and start planting little seeds. Yeah. They say they're not happy and they're trying to get away. He's believed in what the club are doing with them and and what a fantastic player he is and is going to be. There's so much to love about him as well, but every time I see him on the team sheet, and we do it quite a lot with our team sheet, Andy, I, I, you sort of think, right, where is he going to be playing today? Because it, it, he's, you know, he's got that beautiful talent that he can play in the centre, he can play out on, on the right or the left. When you're looking at that team today, where do you think that, that we might see him? I would have thought on the left-hand side of a three, um, whether it's on the right coming inside and Raheem on the other side. Um, but I think there's less responsibility, I think, in that role. I think it's a lot to ask to be whether it's uh, left of a three in midfield or a screen. Uh, it's a massive responsibility in that position, but I think there's a freedom to go and express yourself when you're up top. Um, and like you say, with your energy and the, the desire he has to chase, you know, he can start off them, them traps that, that City try and set throughout out of possession. I know a lot of people want to see him play in that, that middle role. That's me a little bit. Um, but I think at the minute, because he's, he, he's used to playing in that he, he can do both. So even if he's playing wide, a lot of the time you'll see him, he, he tucks in Comes anyway. Inside, right. but because he's got that energy defensively, or if the ball has to go out wide, he can still get out there. So I, at the minute, I really like him in that position, because I think he, he can do both, both, both jobs. And also kind of sitting sort of in the middle as well behind him. Obviously today we've got Gundogan and, and Rodri. Um, how do you like them as a, as a partnership, Andy? Do you prefer it when we just play with, with one of them? Or, or are you happy when you see them both together on the team sheet? I'm a massive fan. I have been for many years of Ferrandino. You know, it's um, for me, he is in the top three 
uh, for me, holy midfielders of, of all time in the Premier League. Um, so, you know, I always look for him first. But, you know, it, rarely do we go two down with two screen. It's, it's not something that's familiar with uh, Pep, you know, and his philosophy on football. Um, so it's slightly different, but the results have come. You know, the, the, the clean sheets are what we're looking for. It means you only need to score one goal. Um, to win a game of football and um, it's refreshing to see that you know Pep's actually thinking a little bit more you know about other sides of the game rather than just winning games of football by sco outscoring the opposition I think football's going that way a little bit more now I think you know we've got to try and not just play the same way City have for years and years and uh, and look at other ways you know because again if you can keep that clean sheet it's so important um, you know you score five goals you get three points you score one goal and win one nil you get three points such a centre half thing to say. That, <laughs> Such a manager thing to say as well, isn't it? <laughs> Um, do you know what? It was, but off that as well, because you were saying it just before we came on the show that you actually think as well, and we'll, we'll get to the the nil nil in, in a little bit. But that it's almost marked a bit of a of, of an era change, not an era change, but a change in mindset that we've never seen from Pep before in his career. Possibly. I mean, listen, Pep is a winner. He he, he wants to win, and it, you, you know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing, you know, and and getting the same result. And eventually, you've got to look at trying changing things a little bit because football's evolving so much now, and there's so much in stats and there's so much detail that every passage of play that City do, the opposition will know, and they'll be trying to suffocate what City's patterns are. And you try and change that a little bit. And you know, I was a big fan of Ed and Jekyll, and I still feel that that option at times when teams are sat in and inviting us to put ball after ball into the box. It's not necessarily that he's going to jump up and head the first ball in, but he keeps it alive in amongst that final third. Things happen from there and just different ways of winning games of football, different ways of playing. And um, I think it is. I really do think that it's a, a, a slight change in mindset. It will still be to dominate the ball. It'll still be all about us and uh, the patterns that we produce in a game, but they're slightly different. I'm looking over your shoulder now and just saying, well, you know, clean sheets are as important. Which is so great as well. So we've been long crying out for as City fans. Well, let's hear um, from the man himself. This is what Pep Guardiola had to say. Pitch side ahead of our game against West Brom at the Etihad Stadium in just under 40 minutes time. Uh, Pep, it was a rare scoreless draw for you at the weekend. Uh, what have you taken from that and what have you underlined to the players tonight? in terms of what has to be better? It's another game. So every three days game, so it's time to relax between the games and arrive in the best condition, mentally, physically, as possible to, to the game. We know everyone what we are playing for today, uh, but in three, four days again, so... Is, <laughs> yeah, we play a game, it's the pass, we do good things, we can, other things we can do better, and yeah, we are going to do it. Five changes tonight, is that to find a bit more sharpness? Is it rotation? I said it's not the rotation, it's I think today at, all the managers put the best 11 to win the game. Uh, and I could select another one, but I decided for this one. It's, it's not for a special reason, so they are fit, they could play, the guys who played last game could play today, but I decided for this one. Phil Foden starts, has he been one of your best players this season? Yeah, hopefully do it too. Offering, what in particular? Uh, his passion. He's a guy who loves to play football and a desire to have the ball, dynamic and goals, the sense of the finishing. So, yeah, decide for him today. In the last game, I didn't decide. So, and he could have played in Old Trafford. So, the manager are crazy. So, sometimes we tried because we woke up in the morning and said, okay, today we're going to play with these ones. And you talk about passion. Obviously, Slaven Bilic represents that, did as a player and, and does as a manager. What sort of challenge will his team offer tonight? A solid. So physicality is at pieces and fast plays up front. He made a good season. He's very happy he's back in the Premier League. He's a, a nice lad and uh, uh, I was happy to see him. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. And that is the thoughts of our manager, Pep Guardiola, before tonight's game against West Brom. And he talks about Savan Bilic there. And we've got some incredible stats tonight. Somebody's been working overdrive behind the scenes this <laughs> week. So this is an insane stat. So Bilic has lost all three of his games against Pep Guardiola's City by an aggregate of 12-1, losing all three of his games in 16-17 when he was the Hammers boss. And uh, we can see them chatting there. And they're obviously friends. They've obviously got, got good respect there, Paul. Have you had any dealings with Savan Bilic at all in your, in your times? Uh, please against him um, and he was a, he was a top player but he was a tough tough um, 
tough, tough defender as well. And you know what you see in the touchline is what you used to see him in the pitch. You know he's enthusiastic. I, I love listening to him. You can tell that he's got energy. You can tell the passion that he's got about the game. And um, when you see him on the touchline, the, the, the players react to it. It's going to be a tough season for them, but he never hangs his players out to dry. He backs them all the way. He's always supportive, and he's he's just a positive guy. You impressed as well by, by Bilic, Andy. I mean, I think West Brom, they've, they've had a tough start, but maybe aren't given enough credit. I mean, not forgetting they went 3-0 up against Chelsea. So there is, I think, something to be positive there for West Brom fans, do you think? I think it's a, a tough start for anyone coming into the Premier League. Um, when I listen to him, he's very honest. You know, he doesn't try and sugarcoat things over. He'll say when they've done well. You know, be honest when they're struggling in a certain area. Um, and it's it's refreshing. And um, But, like... Paul's just said, you know, he's an honest player. He'll, he'll know what he's up against tonight. And I'd imagine everything will be geared around stopping City the best they can. It was interesting the weekend they had 55% um, possession against Newcastle at Newcastle. And um, so it suited Newcastle perfectly to be able to sit in and counter. That won't happen tonight. You know, there'll be a deep block. They'll sit really deep and, um, and try and cut us on the counter. And probably maybe them two holding midfielders will be coming to forward tonight. And stopping that, that, that transition. Do you think there is, the, we, there is a little bit careful caution in that they are fighting to, to stay out of that relegation zone and, and fighting to stay up so it might not be as easy as we think, Paul? No, look, I think if like every game, if Manchester City plays well, well they can do it, it'll be a comfortable night. But um, the football doesn't work like that. <laughs> um, and I've been even the, some of the games I've seen West Brom play. I've been impressed by them. You know, they've got some good players. They'll miss Pereira tonight because he's sort of in, in an attacking sense. He's the one that creates and is, is usually the biggest threat. But they've got lots of energy. And mm. you know, saying about West being, being West Brom tonight and have they got to be cautious? I think you've got to be cautious now in every Premier League game. You know, because they've. They've all got talented players going forward. Um, and saying that, I fully expect us to win comfortably tonight. <laughs> That's what we like to hear as well. You mentioned the Newcastle game as well. And of course, Newcastle scored, Andy, after 20 seconds. It's, it's, I forget that was some sort of Premier League record there. And it seemed like West Brom just switched off. It, you know, the whistle went and they just switched off. They're not going to do that again, surely, are they, against us? <laughs> 19 <laughs> <ima> seconds. <laughs> I'd imagine that's the last thing the, ch the, the manager will say before they actually go out. You know, so I'd, I'd imagine they'll be very alert and switched on in them for a sort of, you know, five to ten minutes. So I don't think we'll say the same mistake again. Um, let's look back then at the, the weekend. We won't speak for on it too long. I mean, there's not too much to speak about, as we found out on the show at the weekend. But um, Paul and, and Andy, both of you, I'd be interested to know, what, what did you make of, of the game at Old Trafford? Because, again, there's been a lot said, as there always is around City. I think we've got to sort through some of the, some of the stuff that maybe isn't true to some of the stuff that is fair enough. <laughs> I, I do think it, um, and genuinely, that it missed the fans and the atmosphere. Um, yeah. I thought that killed the game a little bit. It was... Two teams that, obviously we don't see this a lot in Manchester City, that didn't want to lose. Um, but if you look back, and I know hindsight's a great thing, you know, I said to um, both my lads on Sunday night, what a good point that could turn out to be at Old Trafford, you know, with the other teams dropping points as well. I know Leicester won, Liverpool dropping points at Fulham. So it just it sort of put things into perspective a little bit. Um, you know, you're, going to, you're away from home in a derby game, the one thing you don't want to do is get beat. And I know we want to see all this fantastic football that that we've all loved to see the past three or four years, but it, it doesn't always work like that. And if you're not going to win the game, make sure that... You don't lose Yeah, you, you come away with a point, and you go in tonight and get into the game tonight and get three. Mm -hmm. It's fair to say as well that the men that we've got on the couch tonight, pretty passionate players, pretty sure a derby back then was a little bit tasty when you guys were involved. What did you make, Andy, of the... There's been a lot of talk in the media since the derby of the kind of John Stones and Harry Maguire, the hugging at the end of it, the kind of friendly nature of that derby, which obviously isn't something that we're sort of used to or expect from a derby. But do you think that's like, as Paul said, goes back to the fact that the fans weren't there? And I think... Um more so than ever now, the fact that the, the fact the fans aren't are in games are having a massive impact on the intensity of football. The, you know, um, just the spirit of the game is different at the minute. I think on the the hugging, um, the world's changed. You know, uh, and listen, you've got old school centre half and old school. You know, me and him went to war so many times in games of football. I can't tell you. Um, I remember Paul waiting for me in the tunnel. Believe it or not. Paul were waiting in the tunnel for me <laughs> after the game. This is a funny story, actually. I kid you not. There was, there was a few players there with him at the time. We were holding yeah. him back. It was like scrappy deal or something like that. You, know? you need to tell us more. You can't leave it at that. <laughs> anyway, it's... Um, it, uh, yeah, the world's changed. Listen, and, and I don't like to see it. But, you know, if there's a relationship there and, um, and people are, you know, have a friendship, 
show it in the, in the in the lounge afterwards. You know, it doesn't need to be there in front of you. And um, you know, at the end of the day, football. I, I, I with my own players, I try. I always try and find a different word than the word war. Something that explains. I can't find anything else that explains when you that whistle goes how important this is between these two teams, and it has to be at that level. Um, afterwards, yes, but I think out of respect for the fans, out of respect for the um, you know the people that are paying to watch a game and the the tribalism between two football clubs, I just think wait till you get down the tunnel or players bar afterwards before those sort of things are seen. Yeah, and I don't know about you, Andy. I mean, after. We were teammates and everything else. I don't think I played against you after that. But I spoke to Dunny, a couple of Richard Dunn and Michael Richards about this. But when I'd left the club and I was playing against them, I wanted to hurt them more than I did the teammate, yeah. the, the, as I did the other players. And as much as they were really good friends and were mates, I wanted to show not just the fans, I wanted to show my, the players I was playing with yeah. that, all right, he's my mate, but I'm going to do everything I can to get the best out of him today. And if anything, it was the exact opposite. I would probably target them more yeah. to try and get under their skin because they yeah. were my friends. Because we were always going to make up and have a pint after the game, but it's it's changed so much. And Andy's completely right. You know, you can't. Um, the mentality of players now is it's just completely different from, mm -hmm. from what it was when we were back playing. And then and then off that, and then purely playing devil's advocate, and you say you know fans has had a massive effect on the game as we've seen. But then surely you know is it is it a bit an easy cop out for the players to say well the fans would have helped it make a proper derby because I'm listening going well regardless of fans or not the players should be making it a proper proper derby. Is that a bit of an easy excuse do you think to say it was the fans that dictated it wasn't a proper derby? Oh, I like? think it's real. I think more than ever I think we're beginning to realise that football without fans fans is nothing um, it's it's of course it's real the, the, you know the bragging rights and whatever and the table gives a reflection of it but it's about the fans it's about that intensity it's about that passion the moment the games you know like I'm, I, I was never grew up a City fan but now you'll, you'll Derby Day and big games against the bigger clubs and all that the fans the rivalry it's everything and the players play off that Whatever said and done, um, I think it, there's be certain teams that will help because they haven't got the pressure on them. You know, I think where Tottenham are at the minute, I think, uh, you know, as soon as one result, one thing goes wrong for Tottenham, their fans will turn like that on them because they will not accept it, will not accept being pressured in and accepting just being bullied actually in games, but winning games of football. The fans play playing a massive part in, the, in where we are. I think if you look at the teams at the bottom, and it's gone off piste a little bit, um, you know, about the fans. When you look at Fulham on Sunday, when they had their fans back in. I've watched yes. a lot of Fulham games this season. There might have only been 2,000 in there. Mm -hmm. But from the first minute, whether it was Liverpool, or it didn't matter who they were playing against. Mm -hmm. They went out and they pressed and played with an intensity that I hadn't seen them playing with. And then I look at Sheffield United. They are missing not their fans incredibly. Massively. Yeah. They're not... Their performances aren't that dissimilar from their performances last year. Mm. But especially at Bramall Lane, I mean... Bramall Lane's a fantastic atmosphere Absolutely. when they, yeah. at the start of the game they start playing the music and everything else. Yeah. It, that really affects the players, you know, and um, as Andy said, you know, the, the game is, is, is nothing without the fans and it does affect the players. Uh, off that as well, and, and I asked this to Sean at the week and I asked this to you then, because, you know, we saw that with the start of the season with no fans and coming off the, the bizarre year that we've had, some odd results, do you think we're also going to maybe keep seeing some strange results now we're seeing the introduction of fans back into the stadium then? Yeah, I think it'll take, I honestly do think it'll take players a little while to get back to that again. You know, they, they, they've tuned their brains and their bodies to, and it took them a little bit of time to do it without the fans coming in, and it must have been so weird for them to start off with, but now they've had what, six months, seven months yeah. of not having it, and the possibility of the fans being back in, you know, that, that it's going to take a little bit of adjustment again, as, as stupid as it may seem. I'm kind of intrigued as well, we've gone off on a right tangent, but I'm kind of intrigued as well about why is it fair that some clubs, like you say Fulham, have got fans back in the stadium and other clubs haven't experienced that yet? If we do feel like just having 2,000 fans in a stadium is going to help them, I'm wondering about the kind of where the unfair advantage is on that. But obviously as a manager yourself, currently with Connors Key, Andy, how have your fans found, how have your sorry players found having no fans in the, in the we're, ground. We're, we are not, we don't get a great following anyway. Um, so it doesn't make a lot of difference, but it's, um, there's still, you're still answerable to someone. You know, I still think there's a five, 10% that a player gets more from him, from a fans having to go at him as well. Your, your teammates can, you know, in, encourage you. Your manager can demand more of you, but the fans demand more of you. You know, when you're, you, you hate to make a mistake, you hate to let them down. And, you know, those last 10, 15 minutes in a game, the energy that comes from the fans when they're up on there and they're singing and pushing you on, you know, when the players miss it. 
And, and and do you know what? It just reminded me there, Andy. Actually, while you were speaking about them, them players that fans have respected and could always get behind. And um, we, of course, saw in the news this week the sad passing of Gerard Houllier. Um, so from us all at Manchester City, um, and on behalf of Manchester City, we want to pay our respects and condolences, and our thoughts are with his family and friends at this time. Um, another big big loss for football, Paul, and, and obviously he was a, a legend of the game. Yeah, he was, and look, I only came across him a couple of times very briefly. But if you look at the um, the people who I spoke about him over mm. the last couple of days. Um, the, the one thing that comes out of it is just that he wasn't just a fantastic football man, but he was a fantastic person. Oh, now we are going to look to our Champions League draw in just a second, but there's a question that um, I've been, been wanting to ask Andy when I knew that you were coming on, and it'd be reminiscent of me if we didn't get into this conversation briefly, talking about leadership. And I think we, we spoke about, as Paul, you said at the start of the show, six clean sheets now, consecutive, which is a record. Um, Coming from yourself, how much of an impact has Ruben Diaz had? And, and do, we, do we not realise having a leader at the back really does make a massive difference, not just on the defence, but on the whole team? Yeah, listen, without actually you know, having inside knowledge, we don't know what his character is. We only see what we see on the pitch. But um, I think um, he's brought a steeliness, um, obviously pace. Um, communication's huge, you know, it's, I think that's what Vinny really was at his best was, you know, you, you realise when City are playing and you're a centre half and you're stuck on the halfway line, you need to be alive and communicating and making sure the what ifs, what happens if it breaks down now, making sure people are in the right places, that's so key that you can stifle a, a counter-attack so quickly if you've communicated and organised, Vinny was very good at that mm. um, and you know, it looks like, you know, from what I've seen, there's a voice there, he's demanding, and he's, he's got a good presence as well. I like him. There, there really is, and actually, you'll, you'll see today where we've been fortunate enough to be inside the stadium. If I thought of last season before he was there, we did have a very quiet defence, and you compared it to watching, I hate to say it, Liverpool, and saw the voice that Van Dijk had. When you see now, there is now talking in that back line. And, and for players, Paul, as well, you've got him communicating to the defence. But Sterling's been talking about that he has that voice now, not just on the pitch, but he's finding it in the dressing room. It has a ripple effect on, on the rest of the team. And do you think we've seen that a bit? Yeah, it's massive. It's massive. And like any team I played on was remotely successful. And I had players like, like Andy, who, who were leaders, and they would talk. And look, there's this sort of persona about captains have to shout and have to scream and have to do this they, they don't necessarily but it's not just shouting for the sake of it mm. it's shouting to tuck, look, come and tuck in here a little bit just shield me in front mm. um, and you do need that voice in the pitch but whether it's at the top end but more importantly at the, at the, the bottom end of it and you know when we were linked with Diaz and just before we signed him um, it was just after the national break I think it was, was and it? I didn't know a lot about them, so I thought I'd watch Portugal were playing Spain, I think it was. Um, and the one benefit of not having any crowd in um, was you could hear them. And I looked at them, there was 23, they had Adrian Ronaldo's in the pitch, had Bernardo Silva's in the pitch, Patricio behind him, experienced goalkeeper. He was the one, I thought, my Portuguese isn't great, but, <laughs> uh, but, but he was the one that was barking out orders to people. And I thought to myself, wow, he's, he's 23, you yeah. know, he's, he's still a youngster, but he's shown that leadership then, and that, that got me really excited about him coming here. Even came in and gave that interview in, in English as well, which I think was super impressive as well, wasn't it, Nat? Yeah, and came, like I say, came straight in, hit the ground running. Andy, we've mentioned already that you scored on your debut. We'll just make sure everybody's heard that. You scored <laughs> on your debut. So you, you know, coming into a club, obviously you coming in and, and then you're captain, he really has come in and hit the ground running. How hard is that to do? I wouldn't have thought he's come in and tried to do anything that's not natural to him. Um, that's yeah. the key. You know, you're not going to, you're not being asked to come in and be a leader. They would have already seen them qualities and characteristics in him before it had been identified that that's what we need. And um, so he'll just come in and be himself um, because you see through people very quickly if it's not real. Um, and it's obviously he had that before. Paul's just talked about him there playing for Portugal. And um, yeah, and it's just a natural quality that's missing a lot in football these days and as Paul said there it's it's you know, the information that you're giving is the key that's the thing you know when you're making sure you're not being exposed and it's just pulling people three or four yards it's telling somebody to stop stand still so that when they break down you're still not going to be the first person affected by the ball and it's a it's a it's a gift that you need as a center half and you know what that was slightly different from Ruben Diaz coming in to this changing room than it was coming into our changing room, Andy, wasn't it? What do you mean, Paul? <laughs> that, that, we, we were, all joking apart, we were desperately in need of a leader to come in and help us. We, we had good players, we had good characters, as Andy said, but we, we lacked that little bit on the pitch of Andy pulling people in, talking to people positionally, um, driving you on before the game, and 
well, it showed that was the one ingredient that was missing because we were struggling up until that point. We knew we were a good team. We backed ourselves, but we just needed that kick up the backside, if you want. And that's what I like. I yeah. like about him. You know, he's got a credible presence about him as well. And you know, it's well known. Footballers, players, they don't follow a title. They won't follow captain, manager. They follow courage. You know, Vinny had it in abundance. You know, you think of all the great leaders of all the clubs who've been successful. The the the, the captain, he's courageous. You know, and people follow that, and they and they they aspire to it, and they want to. You know, follow that leadership, and I, I really like him. Off, off that, just, just a question, and, and it might be a silly question, Andy, but you know that thing of what you're talking about, how you're able to see you need to stay there or pull you in three yards. I was, I was thinking that must come from experience, but the guy's 23, so is that something that you can learn? Did, would you, you know, on at training, is it something you're consciously would be thinking about? You, you, you learn it from, you know, when lessons come along, and, and he'll have been exposed in games. He would have found situations right. where he was vulnerable, and he'll have learned from it very quickly again. So there's football intelligence. So not just, you know, you've got raw pace, you're aggressive, but he's also got a football brain. It's without complicating it, it feels at times like a game of chess as your centre half stood on the halfway line and you're looking at so many different areas that might create a, a problem for you if it breaks down. Mm -hmm. He's seen them things and he would have got that from younger years, playing early, um, being exposed, being run, being overloaded in, in certain areas and you know, and it's just refreshing that again, it's that age that he's at and, and he's bringing them qualities to the team. And when you're talking about courage as well there in terms of the players on the pitch, it, as fans as well, that's what we want. That's what we yeah. thrive off. That's what we love. We love our players to be courageous and to show the passion, you know, which is probably you know part of the reason why you guys are sat here now, you know, um, because you showed that on the pitch and we never forget that. Um, we're seeing pictures now there of, of Phil Foden, obviously. He um, will know all about you guys as well, because obviously we know what a big blue Foden is. too young. Is. <laughs> In fact, he might be <laughs> yeah. too young. Yes, was he alive in '99? Let's, let's, let's not go there. We'll move on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he'll he'll benefit as well from having somebody like Diaz next to him as well, won't he, Paul, to just kind of um, you know sh show him. It, it, he's still at his young age, despite the fact that he's got that world class talent. He's still going to benefit from having these leaders around him on the pitch. Yeah, he will do. And, but benefiting from having people like Kevin De Bruyne, um, Sergio Aguero, they, you know, said already, David Silva for two seasons that he's played with, but filling away as, as young as he is, and Andy might be better to pick up on this, but I, I see him as being a leader already, mm. and how he, he's not, like I was saying before, he's not shouting and bawling at everybody else, but he presses the life out of teams mm. when he's got it, he's got an energy and an enthusiasm about him, and sometimes that's just as important as, as having the Andy Morrisons, the Vincent mm. companies at, yeah. at the back and um, it's as if Pep's gave him this responsibility to do it and you know I said um, before in the show that nine times out of ten Phil plays even with its wide or if he's playing in as a ten he's the one that goes and starts the press because mm -hmm. he's got the energy to do it and it shows you that the manager and the players trust him to do that and you know I'll go back to I won't bore you too much with this I think it was no. three, three pre-seasons ago and it was my first trip away with the club and I think Phil had only just turned 17 and Obviously, you'd heard about Phil, you'd seen bits and pieces about him in the academy, and I watched the first training session, um, I think it was in Chicago, that he trained in, and I was amazed, because every time David Silva, Vincent Company, Kevin De Bruyne got the ball, they passed it to Phil Foden, and straight away I thought, wow, and Andy knows this as well, and I've been at both ends of the scale, I've, I've been as a, a young kid going into an Arsenal team with big characters, and if they don't trust you, they look at you, <laughs> and they pass the ball somewhere else. Mm. You know, and I've been that senior pro myself, and it sounds wrong. If you've got a young kid that's coming into your, your training and you're in a training game that you want to win, and you look at them and you think, oh, I don't think I can quite trust them with the ball, you, you will go somewhere else mm. with it. But every time they got the ball, they gave it to him, and I thought, wow. That, that was a big, big statement for me. Mm -hmm. That says it all. And I think as well, what's exciting is even around the club now, still people go, you still haven't seen the, the full Phil Foden yet. There's still so much there for us to, to get excited about. Um, let, let's bring it to the, the Champions League. Of course, the draw happened earlier on in the week. Uh, we drew in our last 16 time. Borussia Much and Gladbach. Uh, the first fixture will be away. So that will be in Germany. Uh, return leg will be at home. Um, a favourable draw, Andy, do you think for City? I think so. I think when you look at some of the other teams, you know, I think PSG, Barca, mm -hmm. when you look at the quality of them two teams one of them is going to be knocked out in that 16 and um, it is you know if you had to I'm not sure about the 16 if you were to cherry pick one which one we would have picked but um, yeah I mean it's their first time at this stage of the competition so it's there for us to you know the opportunity is there to, 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 to progress
kick on into that uh, them next rounds as well. Um, and, and I guess actually it might work in our favour a little bit because we know those those German teams in particular, Paul, they, they tend maybe not to do what we see here in the Premier League is that they are going to attack and they are going to try to play football. Yeah, and look, you, they scored a lot of goals in the group stages. They did, um, yeah. You know, they're a very attacking team. Um, but look, I, I've said it the last few years, so I'm better not, well, I'm going to say it again this year. If, if, if we keep everybody fit, going into these games, I would back our squad against anybody else who's in Europe yeah. in a one-off game or, a, or over two legs, you know, and you need a little bit of luck to, to win any cup competition, so if you can get a little bit of luck and keep the players fit, then I don't see why we can't go all the way. I love, I love being on this show with you, Paul, a few times this season. I, I, I sort of I look to you to say, come on, can you make me feel a little bit better? And I'm fairly optimistic, but <laughs> I, when I looked at who we, we were going to draw in the in the the 16 I didn't fancy like I fancied everybody and nobody following the sort of result against Leon. I kind of thought well it's fine if we draw Barcelona because you know we beat Real Madrid and then I look at the think about the Leon game think about this game people saying that it's a favorable draw and it makes me nervous again so um can you do your magic on me again Paul make me feel a bit a bit better yeah, we'll, we'll batter them. It's <laughs> so, all right now. We'll just keep it as well. We'll go from Paul to Sean Gower as well because he's always good for making us feel positive. Um, speaking of um, European uh, football, and of course we're seeing fans returning to the stadium across Europe and a little bit here in the UK. Um, you might want to check this out because we do this every week. It's around our supporters club. Have a little ganders. Official supporters clubs are a family around the world. With over 300 global branches, our fans can proudly come together and share unforgettable city moments whilst getting exclusive benefits. One family. One family. One family. One family. One family. Our city. Join our official supporters club family today. That's right, we've been awarding our supporters club plaque to supporters club all around the world uh, and this week is no different. Now, Ryan Reynolds, Jim Carey, Justin Bieber, Keanu Reeves, just a few of the Canadians that are big fans of We're Not Really Here, I believe. But um, in particular um, is, of course, our Vancouver branch. Uh, why don't we hear what they have to say? Take it away now, my friends over in Canada. Hi everyone, it's Brian. I'm from the Vancouver branch. I've been following City for about six or seven years now. Uh, ben started the Supporters Club uh, about 10 years ago with the intent of just having a place for City supporters in and around Vancouver to gather and watch the boys. Uh, but since then, it's really grown into a larger community of friends and become a great place for traveling City supporters who find themselves in Vancouver on match day. Um, we meet at the Three Brits pub, which is located across from the beautiful views of English Bay. And not only are we the only club in Western Canada, we are the largest city supporters club in Canada overall. We are also three time back to back to back reigning supporters club cup champions. Uh, and we had our biggest win, an 11-3 smashing over the United supporters. So that was a great, that was a great day. Uh, but we just wanted to say thank you very much for this plaque. Can't wait to get it up in the club and can't wait to see you guys next time you're in Vancouver. Uh, so until then, uh, come on city. And back to the studio. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. it. <laughs> he wants our job. Well done, Vancouver, by the way, beating the United Supporters Club. We will cheer any city team beating any United <laughs> yep. team always. Absolutely. And I think when we're allowed to, I think me and Andy are going to have to take it over to present it to oh, them in person in Vancouver. I'm in. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. See how is it that, is. Is that one country you've not been to with a club, Paul? Yeah, or it have is. You been? Uh, no, well, not to Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got a quick um, spot test for you all on your city knowledge. Uh, looking back to the 2011-2012 season when we won the league, can you tell me a name of a squad member from Canada? In that 2011-12? In that 2011-12 squad. He was also, my tip for you is, he was born in Canada, but I'm okay. not saying he played for Canada. I'm just saying he was born there. Born in Canada? Born in Canada and he was in that squad. Can we come back to that one? I don't know. That's a tough one. I didn't even know we had anyone. Yes. Played, got them. Played, played, had appearances. One, Not just in the squad. One appearance, didn't oh, get a medal. come on now. <laughs> <laughs> great player, though. Great player. Great player. Great pedigree. I wouldn't... I don't know if I get that. One game. One game, got a medal. Anyone at home, you got it? No, you've done me on that. Also played... 
on the other half, for the other half, for the other lot. Played for United. All oh, right. It's Owen Hargreaves. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Born in yeah. Canada. Got yeah, these. Was, Got yeah. them. Was he? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely made up with that. Um, now, keeping along the lines of fans, every home game, the club looks to do something for our junior citizens. And of course, pre-COVID, that would involve some of them walking out as official mascots for the game. So we've worked hard to give it a little bit of a jiggle to make sure we can still do something. And today, the junior citizen of the match um, is, wow, He's from Brazil. Todos, meu nome é Alison, tenho 8 anos de idade. Eu sou o Junior Citizen da partida contra o West Bromwich. Come on, City! <laughs> feel like he just needs to change his name to Edison now. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Alison, love you, mate. Well, Edison, I think, is the name for you. Um, we need to take this moment to talk about um, a, a man that you both know very well, um, Gareth Taylor, of course, now heading up um, our women's team, who had that brilliant win uh, at the weekend. It was a fantastic final goal there from Caroline Weir against Arsenal. Um, what have you made of Gareth Taylor uh, as a whole? Of course, he was coaching, obviously, ahead of our 20 under-23s and now head of the women's team, Andy. Must be uh, must be buzzing. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, we both played with Gareth and... Um, did I see a coach manager at that time? I guess none of us really saw what our path would be. And, you know, I spent a lot of time in, in um, the various age groups at City and, you know, got a fantastic reputation and, you know, great knowledge of the game. So, yeah, it's a, it's a step in a different direction. But, you know, it looks as though it's, a, it's been a great decision by him and the club. And Caroline Weir was named this week the Scotland Player of the Year, which suddenly makes me realise that there's loads of Scots here tonight. Oh, I can't believe we didn't think about this straight off. You're outnumbered tonight. I uh, know. Well, I'll see you later then. I'll go there. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, Caroline Weir, again, always seems to be stepping up with the goals. And, and Natalie, I know we've we watched a few of the, the games as well, but our women's team seems to go from strength to strength, Paul, as well. Yeah, they are. They're slightly slow, slow start to the season. Um, but, you know, they've really picked up and... You know, guys will be delighted with the win at the weekend, especially, you know, a few weeks ago being 2-0 down, 2-0 uh, up against United and, and letting that go. And Arsenal are obviously big title challengers too. So to get that last minute win, you'll be buzzing with that. Is it flipping? And we've had Caroline on the show and she is brilliant. So well in as well to our women's team. Remember, you can keep on following their games as well. And um, speaking of which, we've got a brand new documentary that we want to tell you about. It's coming to City Plus and it is following um, our women's team. It's kind of been charting them over the last six, nine months. We can tease you, I think, with a little trail. Is that right, Gallery? Can we do that? We can indeed. Let's have a take a little look. Nick Cushing's final game as City boss ends in victory. As soon as we, we announced Nick, the reaction was unbelievable. And you know, it's, a, it's an attractive proposition for, for anyone, any coach. We're trying to build a team that is going to be very competitive in all competitions. There's many different ways to win, trying to do it. The city way is really important for me. Ellen White is pissed away! You know, I've, I've, for many years I've seen what this club do, the players they attract. I think it's a really cool and unique and exciting opportunity for me in my career. As soon as I spoke to the staff, it was the place I wanted to be. And it just seemed like the perfect time, the perfect opportunity right now. Is there a chance for Becky to seal it? There is! And it's City's Cup again! Well worth a watch. You can check that out on uh, City Plus, and you've seen there that is a City TV production. There is a whole host of original content on City Plus that is well worth getting your eyes and ears around. Um, you, some of your favourite players might even have a focus on them. We've had Made in Belgium centred around De Bruyne. There's been a recent one on Fernandinho. It's just well worth you going to subscribe uh, and seeing all the content, and you can watch us every time we go live as well. There's also uh, a great show on there uh, which involved you two, which was where that infamous 99 team were, were brought back together um, to re create that all-important moment, probably one of the finest moments in any City fans' um, lives. We've got some clips here. I mean, great moment for us to, to kind of touch upon that 99 playoff final, Andy. And, 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 and what, was, what are your memories of that, that day and the effect it's had on you, I guess? Um, yeah, it was uh, an incredible day. Um, you know, incredibly proud to lead the team out at Wembley. Um, and then, you know, the whole drama of the day, which I don't think in your wildest dreams anyone could ever no. imagine it would go the way it went, you know, to take the, 
to take the players, the fans, and everyone to the depths of despair where we were, and then to turn it around and come back, you know, it, uh, it's still a fondness with the um, with the fans to this day. You speak to fans, and immediately their face glows and a smile, and there's a warmth around it. And I think <laughs> I'm, I'm eventually got hold of uh, of the, the big man there and got hold him down. <laughs> but yeah, it was just it just incredible. And Paul, Paul, we know. I mean, of course, as well, the the, the role that every member played there as well. But but for for you yourself, do you, can you still quite believe it? And and I've all, I've wanted to ask, and you don't have to answer this. But did you was there ever a moment when you thought? I don't know if we actually might have blown it here. Or did you always believe? You have to ask. I don't know, because I always think in them moments, like, even if I think of my experience as the fan of a QPR game, even at the equaliser, I'm like, I'd rather you didn't score that, Jekko. Because I've been, oh, you oh, go. No, I was the other. I was, like, I, I was thinking, you know, there can't be any more. So I just wonder, like, as players, do you always, there was the, that, oh, I don't know if we've blown it. Or are you always like, now we can do it? I'd, um, at 2 0, um, when they scored their second, I thought that was it. Mm. I've got to say. Um, and I, I just remember crouching down and thinking we've blown it. Um, and you see all the fans, you start seeing people leaving, and it was just the most disgusting feeling that you'll, you'll yeah. ever have. And Kevin scored, um, and I do like to say that Kevin scored as well. <laughs> he does as well, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he scored his penalty. And he scored his penalty, yep. Um, <laughs> I knew I was going to... No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> and I, I, when Kev scored, I just I had a feeling that there was going to be another chance in the game. Um, I don't know whether that was um, having my upbringing at Arsenal, but something like Ian Wright. He would, Ian Wright felt he was going to score in every single minute of every single game. Yeah. Um, and it could be the 95th minute, and he would still feel he would get one more chance. And he used to drum that into me as a young kid. Don't get too down. Think one more chance, one more chance. Um, so when Kev scored at 2-1, I, I genuinely felt that... I, there was going to be um, another chance in the game. I didn't really know how long was left either. Maybe if I did know that, could have changed. Yeah, yeah, that's it, interesting. It might have changed how I was feeling about it. But yeah, and I was the lucky little boy still living off one goal <laughs> 21 years ago. Now that they got that chance and stuck you, it away. You say that the lucky little boy, hard work and opportunity. That is what luck is. Um, and then Andy, I mean, kind of subsequently from that. The, the, the rise of, of, of the football club. I mean, we all say that if you didn't do what you did there, I don't know if we'd have the city that we have today. I mean, is there a, there is a real pride that, that you associate when you look back on your time at City? Absolutely, yeah. It's, um, you know, it's played a big part in the club's history. Um, and I, as I said, you know, the fans re remember it fondly. And I think as a reflection as well of where we are now, um, and it's, you know, it's not always been like this and, you know, the, the hard core of our fans have been in some really tough times and, and come through that, come through that adversity, stuck together, you know, didn't disappear and, um, you know, I think now the rewards that we see, again, I often say it is a reflection and it, and it's a reward for their loyalty, yeah. you know. Totally, there's a lot of love. And just to confirm, Phil Foden was not born at 99, no, so that's just going to make us all feel old. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also, I've been told there, a lot of love coming in on socials, um, which I just know will be for, for the rest of time. Now, uh, Nat, you've given us your quiz question, so I've got mine. It's our mystery blue. We do this every week. We have a blurred Manchester City play, and we ask you at home to let us know on social media using our hashtag WNRH or just tagging at Man City to tell us who do you think this is. We're going to have a little look in the studio here ourselves. Needs a bit of music, that sting, I think. <laughs> We're all intently okay. looking now. Have you, Andy, have you got it already? Yeah, I've got it. Okay, all right. Paul, I, I mean, I'm. Slightly easier than Nat's question, I must admit. Okay, do you think you've got it as well? I think I've got an idea, yeah. Okay. My eyesight's awful. I have no <laughs> idea. That might be a man or a woman. <laughs> uh, well, listen, let us know. Uh, you hold on to them. We'll, we'll make sure we get, we get your guesses first before we hear from you guys. But get them in, and maybe at half time or full time, we'll see um, if we're right in the studio and if you've been right at home. And not forgetting as well, I do mention, because I mentioned it on the uh, Derby Day, our Christmas elf is somewhere in the studio. There he is, over there. Welcome along. Gents, we've been trying to get the right name for him. Okay, and have you got our guest? I thought you were all pointing at me, though. <laughs> <laughs> never me, Paul, yeah. anyway. Never me. Um, I, I love how you're asking me to read the names out, Kel, because you know, you know. Well, no, I, listen, this <laughs> is what happened. Cringe. I read out the names last time. I got zero response in the studio. I asked the gallery to go, what do you think in the gallery? Zero response in the gallery. So I've, I've just <laughs> aimed. I'm not doing me. it again. Yeah. And I liked your dad jokes that you had on your last show as well. There we go. I got a similar response, yes. So, um, names coming in for our elf. Elfie Inga Harland. Now, actually, I think we should go for that. Anything that mentions Harland at the minute, I think we should be well and truly going for. Okay. Fabian Elf. 
Or, Personal favourite. That's a, okay. This one's horrendous. Taylor Harwood Slay Bellis. We're really reaching here for yeah, a name, Yeah, we're clutching we? there. If you can do anything better... <laughs> Yeah, let us know. We'll get some. We'll get some Tinder applause, or maybe just something, <laughs> some going across. Um, if you're just tuning in, under six minutes till kickoff, um, we've had uh, Andy Morrison and Paul Dickoff on the show. West Brom, eight o'clock at the Etihad. Um, so now is the time for predictions. Now, Andy, given your debut, we know that you could be odds on to get it right, but we'll let you just have a bit of thinking time, Paul. Given that you've been doing well so far, what are you thinking for? for I'm tonight? going to go four 0 Manchester City. Love that. Okay, back back with the goals then. This game. That's what we like to hear. Nat. I'm going to go 3-0. I think we're going to break this clean sheet record further. Seven clean sheets. Okay, Andy, do you agree? Do you think I'm going to go for 3-1. Interesting. Both okay. teams to score a City win. That's what we love, right? All right. Okay, well, let's hope that someone in the studio is right. I think Andy as well, given the, your debut performances, I might be leaning more towards you, but I'll take the four as well. Um, guys, thank you so much. And um, We are going to be back at half-time. Then we will be back at full-time, as we are every week. So you get a cup of tea, get ready, sit back and enjoy the game, and uh, hopefully someone's prediction will be right in the studio. Uh, see you all at half-time. Enjoy the game.